So um, this, is, this is basically going to be an entire master's course in about an hour, so you've saved a lot of money. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I hope this is vaguely interesting. I, I, I hope that you're interested in kind of the story of us, because this is what it is. This is a story of humans in the last 15,000 years. In the last 15,000 years, we've made some changes. Um, so yeah, this is the book. It's about a third gossipy footnote, so just to give you an idea, uh, which is kind of what this talk will be also. Everything is killing you. Everything. I think many of us has, you know, sort of suspected this was true, but not known it, not been told it by a scientist. So there you go. Yes, you're right. Everything is killing you. And the question is really, I, I think a lot of us look at sort of modern urban lives and <laughs> sit there and go, why? What, what have we done? Um, what happened? Once we were roaming the savannas with perfect abs, perfect teeth. Has anyone seen sort of stock photos for paleo diet magazines? We looked amazing. <laughs> what happened? Um, I'm not sure that we can really say that bacon flavored cupcakes are the harbinger of the apocalypse, but it might not be far off. So there's, there's a, I think a real sense that people have, which is that somewhere between technology and bacon flavored cupcakes, Everything is killing us. And it turns out that this is something we can actually do science about. This is what I do, um, is try and explain how we got here, how we got hunched over our phones, sort of uh, worried about the size of the dent in our office chair. And it turns out um, it's kind of a long story. Um, and the way I'm going to tell it is through my field of experience. I am a professional digger up of dead people. I am a bioarchaeologist. This is a real job that you can actually have. Um, and, uh, and so uh, this book is actually mostly about kind of the evidence from our actual skeletons, from our actual bodies, that sort of speaks to how we have ended up as a nearly 60% urban species. So by 2030, the idea is that human beings will be 60% urban. We are already majority urban dwelling species. This is pretty much the biggest change that we have made since, you know, some serious decisions about trees some time ago. Um, and I'm going to try and tell this story mostly coherently. So we're going to have to start at the beginning. And the beginning um, is probably best addressed. This is not an archaeological dig. This is archaeologists digging out a car. Um, I'm going to start in Jordan. This is a series of very prominent academics who study the sort of crucial change between the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. The Mesolithic is our hunter-gatherer days. The Neolithic is the fancy stuff. This is when we come up with the major changes, which are settling down, farming, domesticating animals. Uh, but first, you have to get there. And it turns out Jordan is a wonderful place, but the roads don't always work. Um, so we have really some quite prominent archaeologists um, directing some less prominent archaeologists <laughs> as to how to dig a jeep out of a wadi and me taking photos, because I'm helpful like that. So let's talk real estate. One of the first major changes that our species made was just settling down. We have been free range for a very long time, 200,000 years. Uh, well, it depends on how far back into our history you want to go, but settling down is a pretty shocking change. Uh, yeah, and you can see here the reconstruction. This is um, further up that knot road. Um, this is Wadi Fainan in Jordan, and someone has made a reconstruction of what one of these very early year-round dwellings would have looked like. They did not realize that if you put a fire in something without a chimney, it is not a very good reconstruction, so they did nearly kill quite a few archaeologists. This was later rectified, so um, but experimental archaeology can be very exciting, as can archaeology in general. So <laughs> move, trying to move on, um, this is also what happens if you take prominent archaeologists up a very steep road in Jordan. And then it turns out that uh, some 4x4s, not actually meant for 4 by 4 through wadis, and the battery will fall out. And then you will have two Bedouin teenagers, the gentleman without shoes in the picture here, um, who come and tell a room full of professors how to fix a Toyota. Um, it, is, it is a remarkable experience being an archaeologist sometimes. Again, note my level of helpfulness. I'm in the back taking pictures. 
But this is so, so this, this radical decision to stop wandering around actually has real physical effects. And in sort of theory of if you don't use it, you lose it, this applies to your skeleton. If you don't put constant pressure through use on the bones of your body, it's, um, you know what, the bone doesn't feel much like building itself up. If you're not uh, building up muscle and things, you can actually lose bone density. And what we see by going around, CT scanning, x-raying, measuring very, very particularly, is there is a change, particularly in our lower legs, when we go from wandering around to sitting still. So this little diagram, um, because I wanted to make sure you felt like you really got a lecture, so there are boring diagrams for you. Um, this is kind of going through time period. The very top there, the CCR, that's the bone density of a cross-country runner. So if you see that line, that's the top. That's actually, that bone density is of your shin, which is, of course, you know, your tibia. is the bone you bark on coffee tables. Uh, it's a painful bone. Um, but in a cross-country runner, that tibia is really important. You actually build up more bone. If you're an ultra marathon runner or um, you know, professional runner, you need that tibia, so you have a much larger bone. By the time you get to the Neolithic, you can see that first little T-shaped bar there. That's a lower level. And then also for comparison, we've got some um, Adam and Islanders who are not living a totally settled life. Um, we've got uh, sedentary controls. And then we've got field hockey players. I'm not sure why they included them, but apparently not, not the strongest tibias in the world. So we've already revolutionized our bodies just by settling down. We've got skinnier legs. Well done, us. I'm now going to move slightly further over. And um, just because, I guess, well, this is Google. So we're going to go to Antikythera. Um, does, I, has anyone ever heard of anything involving computers in Antikythera? Yes, thank you. Thank you for nodding. So um, the Ant Antikythera is mostly well known for the shipwreck that went down off the side of it. Um, lots of things sink there. Uh, for the Antikythera mechanism, which is occasionally brought out, um, and newspaper editors like to call it the world's first computer. It is not. Uh, it's cool. It has gears. A computer it is not. But um, the reason I am telling you about Antikythera um, is because I had to spend a lot of time there, and so we're going to spend a lot of time there. Now, um, it's a beautiful island, but the one thing about this wonderful, amazing island, other than the fact that the boat is way bigger than the harbor, which means that the boat does not always make it into the harbor, which kind of sucks if you have 25 undergraduates and there's no more food. Um, they get restless. Um, it, it was actually kind of awesome. I, I will say that um, because this island only has about 40 people living on it, um, it's, it was completely abandoned, cleared off by the Nazis in the Second World War. Um, it only has 40 people living on it. They're all elderly. None of them farm or do anything anymore that involves making food. So the food comes on the boat. So if you take the only car, luckily there's only a mile of road, so no one really misses the car. Um, but if you take the car to the big island to buy food, and then you come back, uh, and you can see the shore, and you have the car full of food, and you can see your undergrads, and they're, they're kind of on the headlands waiting for the food. And then the boat just doesn't land, and it turns around and goes to Crete, and you have to have an enforced holiday in Crete. Um, when you come back, there is anger. Um, moving on. It's a very harsh landscape. It's quite a prickly landscape. Um, it's actually sort of a, a more or less a barren rock in the middle of the sea. It's quite difficult to live on. Um, this was the situation we were reduced to trying to watch the World Cup. What you can't see is the Coke cans and the clothes hangers wired into a fence in an attempt to boost the antenna. Almost worked. This is actually what I want to talk about. And goats will be a major theme. Look out for goats. Were this a drinking game, goats would definitely be a shot. But goats are the next step. So the goats on Antikythera are basically a walking larder. They are or once were domesticated. Now that there's only 40 people to control them, they kind of roam free, they hide in abandoned villages, they peer at you from ridgelines, they're super threatening actually. Um, but they were at one point moved to that island, probably by, a, well potentially by Cretans or someone else, and they were sort of held there and managed there in order to feed humans. These are domesticated animals. And domesticated animals are a huge step for humans. This is a very exciting, you know, meals on hooves. Yes, we, we no longer have to go chasing these things. We can bring them 
into the house, have them on hand. You know, your walking larder no longer is walking quite so far away or so fast. However, is it a good idea to live in the same house as a goat? Possibly not. One of the things about the domestication of animals is that it puts us in very close contact with animals. It also puts us in very close contact with secondary products. These are um, everything you get out of an animal that isn't meat, so milk, fur, leather, all of these things. Milk in particular, and the Mediterranean specifically, has been a long-term problem because goats have something called brucellosis. And brucellosis will do this to your spine. In case anyone's wondering, your spine should not be riddled with holes. That is not normal. It should not look like that. And this was actually a huge problem, only finally solved uh, by pasteurization, which got rid of the brucellosis bacteria. But um, we see evidence of brucellosis entering the human skeletal record with the sort of domestication of animals. So great job finding a new source of food, but there is still a potential for it to either kill you or at least make life dramatically uncomfortable. Going back to dramatically uncomfortable. We will go back to central Turkey. A lot of my work is in central Turkey in the sort of um, large agrarian plains, central Anatolia. And this is a Shiklahoyuk, which I think is pretty much the coolest site ever, so you will all be forced to agree. Um, this is a reconstruction of a Neolithic village. So finally combining all of these sort of um, Neolithic things that we've done with settling down, domesticating animals, and um, domesticating something else, which is, of course, what the paleo diet would have you believe is killing you right now. Um, this is wheat. Well, that's Muge. And Muge is uh, tending to her experimental crop of Neolithic wheat. So not, uh, not content with building an experimental village, we've now got Muge doing experimental wheat. Um, and I, I have to admit that the thing you learn about Neolithic farming is it is boring. Because I watched Muge do this for like hours, and then I was like, no, I, I really have to go now. Um, because what I'm interested in is not just, you know, the sort of invention of wheat and how people did it, but what it did to us. And this is where we come to my actual real sort of scientific specialty, which is in fact teeth, dental tissue analysis. Um, but for your sake, we are not going to go deep into that. But teeth are probably one of the most obvious places to look for changes that happen with the Neolithic. The way we eat changes. Um, in what I would like to call the pot noodle phenomenon, we move from a very sort of quite a big variety of foods to something that might have quite a lot of carbs in it, and carbs that don't require a lot of processing, don't require a lot of chomping. With the reduction of on that sort of, you don't use it, you lose it sort of um, phenomenon, you get um, a slow reduction, probably in the size of your jaw. <coughs> How many of you were, um, have wisdom teeth? Yeah, yeah. Increasingly, people are born without wisdom teeth. If you don't have room in your jaw, it is possible for the wisdom teeth just to not form. That is one of the major evolutionary changes that is happening to our species right now. We are losing a tooth. There are people born without wisdom teeth and presumably without attending sort of pain and dental bills. So teeth are actually incredibly interesting part of the story. And I could go on like a lot longer, but for your sake, I won't. Um, some other things that agriculture has allegedly done to us. And this one is fairly uh, like, a, you know, there's, there's a smoking gun here. Uh, there are some things wrong with this dentition, besides obviously the fact that it is not in a person anymore. Um, there are giant gaping holes in the teeth. This is caused by bacteria. These are caries. If you were allowed to just eat bacon flavored cupcakes, this is pretty, and you never brushed your teeth, this is pretty much what would happen to you. So the change in our diet actually changes the bacteria in our mouth and the way it's able to affect our teeth. We get rotten teeth. So we've got shrinking jaws and rotting teeth. So far, the Neolithic's looking great. Now it's looking shiny. This is a tooth. Take my word for it. Um, this is actually a sputter-coated, lightly sputter-coated in about a micron of gold cast of a tooth. Um, this is canine, so your big sort of vampire tooth. Your teeth are fossils. They form when you're a kid. Um, they're a perfect record 
of everything you do. So if you break a bone, it knits back together, yeah? We're pretty much, we believe that. Chip a tooth, no, doesn't happen. Um, that's just expensive. So your teeth are these wonderful fossils and they have a record of growth. So can you just about make out the horizontal lines that are, cr that are crossing that tooth? Your tooth is like a tree. You have tree rings. These are actually visible on the outside of your tooth with the suitable tools. If you brush your teeth, they're probably gone by now. So sorry, before you go home and go like, ah, I didn't grow. Um, I, I hope you brush your teeth. I really advocate doing that. Um, but this, uh, those lines form at once about every week. And that gives us a record of growth from about one year to six. So we can actually look at that and work out not only sort of your growth pattern, but when growth stopped. Can you see the big giant gash that's like on the top third of the tooth? There's a big gaping line. Something bad happened. Something happened to that kid where resources going into growth stopped. Common causes would be disease, malnutrition, and particularly fevers. So those are um, reasons why you would have these lines on teeth. And what we can do is survey these lines on teeth and start building up like a population level picture of when kids are getting sick and try and look at whether those kids are getting sick pretty much all at the same time, um, which might indicate it's something to do with the way their lives go. And what we find in the Neolithic is a story that we can probably best explain going all the way over to Paraguay. Um, these are uh, Ache indigenous people from Paraguay, and they are trying to illustrate my point. That's obviously why they posed for this picture. Um, they, uh, in the 1970s, the Ache, who had been hunter-gatherers, were forcibly settled and uh, moved into a totally sedentary, totally agriculturally based life. The Ache, generally, as hunter-gatherers, had children about four years apart. Um, if you've ever tried carrying a toddler and an infant at the same time, mm -hmm. you will understand why. If you tried doing this in a like rainforest where you need your hands to also get food, I mean, you will understand that four years is cutting it fine. Um, in sort of in normal child rearing practice, when hunting and gathering, when out in the jungle, you know, the child doesn't get more than a meter away from the mom. However, when they moved to settled accommodation, suddenly you could have multiple children sort of around one sudden, you know, one grandma or auntie sitting there, and the birth spacing decreases. It goes to about 2.5, 2.7 years on average between siblings. So we see you can have more babies. And this is kind of the story of the Neolithic. We have never done anything that is so good for building more humans than just sitting down and making more babies. Um, and it, it's made a huge, huge difference in our lives. So this is Chadelhoyuk, which is another one of these Neolithic sites, also central Anatolia, about a thousand years later. Um, and this is really coming into the time of villages, and villages are very exciting. Um, by the way, uh, the, there's almost no gaps between these buildings. So those ladders you see are actually how you would move around. You get on top of the roofs and walk around on top of other people's houses. Uh, I saw that acted out once. It was hilarious. Um, so we come to villages, and villages are where we start to get new stories, and they also have an impact on us. This rather unprepossessing picture contains some of the most sort of, um, well, pernicious and deadly evidence for things that we later come up with on our journey to urbanism. Okay, it looks like dirt. It is dirt. But that dirt is a series of small walls, which, as Eddie Izzard has informed us, is the entire point of archaeology. Um, but here, does this work? Oh, yeah, it does. Okay. Um, these are storage bins. Storage bins, the Tupperware of the Neolithic, not very interesting at sort of first glance and second glance and when you have to draw it and when you have to dig it. But when the, in the village, in the Neolithic village, we see a movement from communal activity, uh, egalitarian societies feasting together, sharing resources. You can have sort of a, a special person, like a shaman or something, in an egalitarian society. Egalitarian just means, you know, everyone's equal. Well, they say it means everyone's equal. It's like Barbara still gets screwed on the whole deal. Uh, well, Frank is like, ah, everyone's favorite. Um, but you move, in the Neolithic, you move from a relatively egalitarian society to a society 
where resources are no longer held in public. These storage bins are in a house. That house is accessible by one group of people, not by everyone. You start to see ovens, places where you would do cooking, move from outside to inside. And you start to see a series of small walls. And these walls build up differences in access, access to resources. And this is the kind of road to inequality and the road to cities that pretty much hangs over everything else we've done for the last let's go with about 9,000 years. Um, you start to get uh, in temples, there's a special room where special people can talk to the gods. Uh, and you know, there's a special storage room where only your family can go. This is what we're talking about in terms of access. We can see it in the archeological record through walls, and we can start to see it through material culture. This is the standard of Ur, the royal standard of Ur, which is very exciting um, if you're me. And this, I think you can all see this is, um, this is from about well, 4,500 years ago, it's quite old. Um, can you see there's one dude who's bigger than the rest of the dudes? That is the important guy. That is the important guy. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about hierarchies, the hierarchies necessary to get all of those human beings to live together result in someone being at the top register of that standard. Also, there are goats. So the, this sort of, um, this, this inequality in access resources, again, we can actually start tracking in skeletons. So access to resources includes access to food. This is your skull. It's not your skull. Let's hope it's not your skull. Um, what is quite difficult to see, but you can just about make out, do you see these little pinprick holes and things that are here? This is a very small, delicate sign that you have scurvy vitamin deficiencies. If you do not have access to a wide and varied diet because you are not the dude at the top of the chain, you can start to see nutritional deficiencies. And we actually start to see these at the sort of beginning of urbanism. So there's scurvy, everyone's favorite, rickets. Rickets is a disease of childhood when you don't have enough vitamin D. Uh, your bones are sort of demineralized. And when they're growing demineralized, um, just the weight of walking on them bows them out of shape. So the sort of typical bowed legs of rickets is actually caused by the weight on the skeleton and these, these bones not being really properly mineralized, so they sort of bend slightly. Uh, the good news is you can mineralize those bones, but you can't really get them back into shape. So we start to see evidence of vitamin deficiencies. And of course, there are other things that inequality leads to, which is, go back to standard of or Someone is more important than you. Someone wants what you have. I'm pretty sure this guy at the bottom here did not choose to end up in this position. And this is the story of violence. This is the story of humans being terrible humans. I think we all are aware of the sort of um, axiom that humans in aggregate suck. Um, I don't think that's been disproved yet, but um, we start to think about cities and we start to think about um, the kind of violence inherent in so many people living together. Uh, and in our defense, chimps are way worse. Chimps are terrible, terrible people. They're also terrible chimps, actually, just chimps are terrible. Um, so actually, this is actually a really big question, is how violent are we? I mean, compared to sort of other mammals and primates and things. And, um, how long have we been that terrible? <coughs> so this, this is a bone, well spotted. Um, it's from Cima de los Huesos, which is a, <laughs> the pit of bones, which is in Burgos in Spain, uh, this huge karstic region. It's got caves everywhere full of dead people, very, very old dead people, and not necessarily people, but hominins, so people who came before us. So this is from a homo antecessor site, and a bunch of bodies were found in a cave with cut marks. 850,000 years ago, before Neanderthals, before we even got around to sort of being properly sophisticated and having royal standards of ore, people were terrible people. So there is a long evolutionary history of violence and conspecific violence, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, human on human. Um, so I mean, are we really that bad, given that chimpanzees will kill anything, if given half a chance? I'm very mean about chimpanzees. I'm slightly scared of them, sorry. Um, 
you know, and that we have a long evolutionary history of violence. And this is another thing that bioarchaeologists can look at. Um, this is your skull. This is your skull on violence. That is a depressed skull fracture. Um, so were you to be hit aggressively on the head with something, you would end up with a fracture in your skull. I think this surprises no one. This picture actually is um, interesting because this is a healed depressed skull fracture. If you were to find fresh, sharp edges, it would be something that had happened recently, and especially if it sort of punctured in through the brain, um, the person would have died of it. Uh, so now you're all qualified for forensics. Um, but this is healed. You can see the soft edges where the bone has slowly knit over. And um, the story of depressed skull fracture is actually really interesting. It's one of the first things that I was interested in um, when I started this whole archaeology lark. I grew up in California. You may be able to tell that from the accent or not. I've been here for some time. Um, but uh, California is home to the Chumash Indians. And they uh, sort of cover an area from Malibu to sort of up through Santa Barbara. So obviously a terrible place to do field work. Um, and one of, the, one of the first papers I read was about this woman this, uh, whose skull was found. And, and the Chumash are these excellent, they live on the coast, they're, they're basically sort of, um, they invent money. They sort of live in one place, but they're not really urban people. They're just kind of chilling with boats and stuff, because it's California. Um, and so they, uh, there's this one lady there, and they, they found her skull, and she has nine depressed skull fractures. I thought that was very interesting. Why, you know, what in your life happens that you get this many depressed skull fractures? We know that, you know, they can be signs of violence that are associated with um, things like domestic abuse. Before we invented cars, basically, all depressed skull fractures were pretty much violence or falling. Um, but falls are unlikely. So this woman had nine, and um, so uh, finally the paper explained that um, farther north in a different group, some highly judgy Spanish friars had observed um, a group of natives settle an argument. And what they had done was sort of two, two people would sort of face off and each one would have in their hand a spatula. It's like a sweat scraper. It's basically a stick with possibly a shell on the end. It is, it is actually a slightly formidable weapon. But what they would do is they'd face each other and they'd sort of, um, to settle the argument, they would each take a swing. Smack. And whoever drew blood, one argument was settled. Everything was peaceful. And and I just I, I, this woman had nine such depressed skull fractures. Like wow, way to hold your own in an argument. You know, you obviously survived at least the first eight. Um, but actually, this is kind of belying the underlying story of violence like this, which is that we see evidence of violence in the skeletal record. But it's not necessarily the sort of um, massive competition, the sort of you know, wars of conquest. A lot of it seems to happen at times of instability. So we see depressed skull fractures actually less in the early, early cities. They are more frequent sort of prior to or when cities are collapsing, when urban civilizations are really collapsing. Um, so it's possible that actually as people move together, becomes less important to actually bash someone over the head than to just look like you're capable of doing it. And this is the idea that as we sort of move into a more urban world, in order to cooperate, in order to get that many people to live together, as long as you sort of, you know, walk softly, carry a big stick, but don't actually hit anyone with it, um, it's actually much more conducive to a, a larger group of people living together. So this is the site that I currently work at, which is my favorite site, so you're gonna see a lot of it. Um, this is Bashar Hoyek. Uh, currently we're not digging because it's about an hour and a half drive from the Iraq, Syria border in, in Turkey, and it's not a good scene. Um, these are spearheads, these guys. This is like a pile of spearheads. So you might think, okay, dig up a grave, tons of spearheads, warrior, right? Then you get me, I show up on site, I'm like, no, those are two 12-year-old kids, sorry. And then you have to sit back and think, why you know, have we got all these spearheads? And it might be that actually spearheads are more worthwhile as sort of an idea. They're, they're actually more worthwhile as something that you could exchange and impress people with than as actual weapons of war. Because cities need bling. This is a very important part of cities. You cannot impress your other urban elites without mad bling. Goats. Goat bling. It exists. This is actually very impressive in case anyone wants to know. Um, we killed very few people uh, on this 
expedition. I'd like to point out that this is basically how all of this information gets retrieved. Um, both of these archaeologists lived. It was 50 degrees in our defense. Um, and this was all excavated, highly sort of um, efficient team, working very hard, not constantly chain smoking in my trench, and with modern techniques that really sort of, um, to be fair to me, actually, the entire thing is recorded photogrammetri uh, photogrammetrically and will be built into a sort of astounding 3D, which actually looks quite cool and spins around and it's awesome, and they're drones. Um, but also, there are some practical issues just with digging. The other cool thing that is on the site, and I don't know if you can actually make it out, but what they are digging is a mass death pit, which brings us to other questions of human violence which don't involve one person smacking the other with a spatula. They involve more concentrated violence. So is it true that cities are when we get big scale community violence? Let's ask Germany. This is a very pleasant place in Germany. Um, except for in the Neolithic, it might have sucked to live there. The Talheim massacre is now relatively well known, but until fairly recently, people assumed the Neolithic, the sort of happy village time. Um, it, is, it has been accused of being the sort of yogurt crocheting zenith of uh, archaeological theory. That essentially, you know, in the past, everyone sat around crocheting their own yogurt, and that was, you know, a thing. And it turns out, no, they also committed huge massacres with their farming implements, wiping out entire communities. So the history of people killing and wiping out entire other communities. This is actually, Talheim is much more recent than um, there's a site near Lake Turkana, which has certainly been suggested to be a massacre of 26 people um, with arrowheads, with blunt force trauma. And that's dated 10,000 years ago, well before any villages even in that area. So we do know actually that people are terrible people. And one of the things that um, has sort of been pointed out is that actually, you know, modern warfare might kill less people as a percentage of the population that exist in total, even despite the sort of mass casualties and the horrific things that happen around the world, that we actually might kill less people now than we did as angry little villagers. Um, and there's a paper in Nature to back me up on this, so you don't have to believe me. Um, this, more boring charts for you, you're welcome. Um, that's us, we're, we're over there. Um, and that is chimps. I am totally, totally justified in saying chimps are terrible. Um, but just as a general animal, this is a Nature paper from last year, just as a general animal, you have more or less violent tendencies. And these are measuring conspecific killings. So, you know, um, species on species violence. So the more terrestrial you are, the more territorial you are. Things like that. Um, different ways of organizing yourself. And if we take this back into the past, no, you don't have to read that. Um, just realize that this is an arc. This is an arc going up. So starting at the very beginning from the Paleolithic, which is all the way over there, and it goes up like this. This is Europeans coming to North America. That is the best we ever got at killing. It's wiping out huge numbers of human beings. But we have got better. Our, our levels of how many people are killed by people are actually more similar to where they were in the Paleolithic than where they were in the medieval era. So <laughs> we don't need to jump off bridges just yet. There's another thing about urban style conflict though that we do have to think about. This is what a Mongol siege looks like. Um, many of you will not have seen one of these in real life, so I provided a picture. Um, it is not the actual siege of Kaffa, but um, it is there to illustrate a point. So Kaffa was an Italian trading outpost, more or less on the Silk Road. The Mongols were less interested in this being there or they just wanted it or something and they started attacking. Unfortunately, this was in the mid 14th century and they all got very sick. The besieging army was suddenly struck down with some sort of terrible pestilence. And they decided that um, the best possible option because they were all going to die and they hadn't managed to take Kaffa, was to start chucking the dead bodies over the walls into Kaffa um, and thus giving us our first, well, first known um, example of biological warfare. 
And of course, what did they have in sort of um, you know, the mid 14th century? This was Black Death. And that is actually very much a city story. So this is an urban trading city, this is Genoa, and they, are, they have this little trade outpost. Their city requires trade in order to survive. The economics of urbanism require roads, trade, um, all of the things that move people and goods in order to survive. That's what an urban economy needs, even in the medieval period. And what else moves on roads? Diseases and armies. Now, for archaeologists, actually, plague is very difficult. It's very annoying, because until the advent of modern genome sequencing, we were really bad at finding it. There's no way to tell, because plague kills you quickly. Unlike some of the other fun diseases, which kill you very slowly and make changes to your skeleton, plague kills you quickly. Um, but we can dig them up in nice little neat rows. This is um, from the Royal Mint site in London, by the way. There are huge plague pits all over London, like everywhere. Like under Liverpool Street Station, like anyone who has to go through there, a lot of plague. Uh, you're fine now, it's not contagious. Going back to armies, armies carry other things. Um, armies are full of, well, traditionally men, uh, but they are also generally accompanied by other professionals. And one of the things that um, well, still baffles archaeologists uh, is a story that sort of begins with a siege of Naples. Well, it sort of begins in the New World. Then there's some Columbus action, and then nobody knows what happens, but by the Siege of Naples, which is depicted here, there is an army that is marching, and is marching with a new disease, which is going to make everyone freak out. And this is syphilis. Syphilis is bad for you, don't get syphilis. This is actually third stage syphilis. So syphilis, uh, if, if you're interested, um, actually can lie dormant for quite some time. So many people would have died of other things well before the syphilis got this nasty, but this is properly nasty. And we actually recognize it through this characteristic appearance, like ch hardened chewing gum on a skull called Kerry's Sicca. Um, so syphilis is something biologists like, because we can diagnose it. It's like, yes, great, I know what this is. Next one. Oh, I don't know. Um, I feel bad for Mr. Norris, who's actually the surgeon who collected this and not the <coughs> syphilitic, but yeah. <laughs> Problem with syphilis, of course, is that they thought mercury cured it. Hence the amusing catchphrase, a night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. Awkwardly, Mercury makes you go crazy, but so does neurosyphilis. So it's kind of a toss up which one would kill you, Mercury poisoning or the neurosyphilis. But I kind of think if you got the point of being mad, the Mercury might have been just a relief at some point. So coming into kind of the story of modern cities, we've talked about diseases that are moving between cities and the sort of increasingly globalized, um, sort of acquisitive, you know, sea routes and roads. Um, there are other things in the city that can kill you, one of which is working. Working can be a, a, a city is an incredibly exploitative economy that eats up people. That is what urban economies do. They draw in more people and for a long time, London, killed way more people than it grew. Um, it just ate immigrants from everywhere. And it brought them in, and it put them to work in places like match factories. Matches used to be made of white phosphorus. You should not hang out with white phosphorus. It is not good for you. Um, these are two gentlemen. If you see these little um, weird sort of wooden boards that they've got, those are matchsticks. What they're going to do is take the matchsticks and dip them in white phosphorus so that the heads have white phosphorus. So they are hanging out over an open vat of white phosphorus. This is your jaw on white phosphorus. This is uh, bone necrosis, uh, where the bone has died. There's, there's so much poison has been taken up, the bone has actually rotted away. Um, we like to take our students to see these and tell them that it glows in the dark. <laughs> it doesn't, but that's all right. But so, so work can kill, everything can kill you. Everything is killing you, back to my original point. But this is actually where I get slightly more optimistic, which is essentially in the sort of late Victorian era, people refused to be killed by white phosphorus. It was in a city, you know, the, these horrible working conditions, they're actually fixed in a city. So we had the Match Girl strike, which actually a uh, very impressive early strike, and it got such attention 
these poor people who are being exploited, they have these terrible working conditions, and they're dying from their work. And it leads to strikes, and it leads to progressive change. It leads to, in 1912, the banning of white phosphorus. So it, it is sort of, um, it's a horrible story, but there is little room for hope. And we'll just go to the sort of very last bit, because cities obviously are continually killing you. The other way they're killing you is because they are polluted. If anyone has tried to breathe in London recently, you may be aware of this fact. Um, and, uh, and actually, I'm not, I'm not too sure there's room for optimism on that. But um, back, back in the day, so we'll go back to the 19th century, and water supply. The Romans had a great water supply. The Victorians had totally forgotten about this. They, they just ignored it and made their own, and it didn't work very well. And this is a contemporary cartoon showing all of the horrific things that are going into the Thames and then coming out in your drinking water. And we come to this map. This map is one of the most famous maps um, for all of sort of health professionals. This is John Snow's map of dead people. There was a cholera epidemic in Soho and it killed a lot of people. Um, and there was a big th conversation about how you got cholera. You got cholera, everyone thought it was a miasma, which is this like sort of um, specter of this cloud of noxious fumes, sort of like um, if you've heard of people in the Black Death um, fighting the plague with like posies, with burning herbs and things. It's the smell that gets you. This was a really current medical theory. John Snow was like, no, it's water. Don't drink the water. And everyone's like, mm, shut up. You know nothing, John Snow. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> my, friend, my friend came up with that joke, and I, I've stolen it. Oh. Um, but so John Snow, he, he sort of, he actually gets aggressive enough. So he starts mapping the deaths. So he's drawing out, these little blocks are the number of dead people. And they're, they're all sur surrounded in an area. Okay, that makes sense. It could be just noxious air in one area. But weirdly, the people in the workhouse who have their own well are fine. And the brewery workers are fine. And this is because, of course, the source of contamination is a pump, which is bringing out the choleric water. The brewery workers are fine because they're drinking beer. Because why would you drink London water? That is a terrible idea. And because of this, you get major structural change. And this is kind of my point with cities, um, just to stop everyone from like, jumping off a bridge. Um, we do fix the problems of cities in cities. Uh, John Snow went through the waterboard. There are, you know, this is where the solutions to the problems that cities come up with come from. They're urban problems, but it doesn't mean that we're totally doomed. Um, there are choices. There are choices that we can make, probably, whether we want to go like full dystopia. Um, I really enjoyed Mad Max, don't want to live in it. Um, or, you know, whether we want to let. Um, Patrick Stewart lead us into sort of the future. I'd say I'm way more on the Star Trek front, um, but there are options. Right, I will happily take questions, um, answer anecdote-related qu queries. Um, yeah? Oh, sorry. I'll yeah, just curious, could, could have it gone differently? Like evolution and everything, like what was the option back then? And I, think, I think there are a lot of options. Um, I mean, it's kind of a, a deep philosophical question, sort of, can, you know, could anything have gone differently? And probably there are other multiple universes where we're still wandering around doing other things. But um, I think farming is actually, the sort of idea of the Neolithic, of sitting, settling down and sort of living year round, is something that people tried several times. So I think we would have always eventually kind of done that. So there's, there's actually now evidence that people were sort of messing around with breeding grains and stuff from, I think, like 23,000 years ago, which is 10,000 earlier than we knew. But they gave it up. So it's possible that we actually always would have eventually gotten to this point. Um, but we just, you know, we sort of failed a couple of times. Other than the wisdom teeth you mentioned earlier, are there any other factors of our lifestyle now which you think the archaeologists of the future will be digging up and, and observing? We, we were having this conversation earlier because I am a text walker. And um, so there's, there's a combination of things that you just worry about, you know, what your neck and your thumb are doing when you're sort of 
doing this and whether most of us will end up under buses because we are you know, answering some sort of uh, you know, email or something. Uh, it's difficult to know what will affect your skeleton. I think one of the things that um, we'll certainly notice is the number of surgical interventions. We will be found with stainless steel hip joints and stents places and all sorts of interventions. Uh, now we've got to the point where actually a lot of the early surgical um, sort of experiments are now archaeological. They're no longer sort of modern, but they're, they're sort of um, historical enough that we have excavated, you know, some of the pioneering surgeons' early work and you sort of go, ooh, uh, glad you practice on dead people. Um, so I think we'll probably see increasing signs of human intervention. Uh, I think our, our faces are slowly shrinking. I'm slightly concerned we are going to end up looking like little grey aliens, you know, with a giant skull and big eyes, because we're super into neoteny, which is the word for babies are cute. Um, no, that's not really how you translate. Anyway, the same reason that your dog does not look like a wolf, it looks like a puppy. And the reason that we find kittens adorable is uh, supposed to be something that's built in so that because we favor big eyes. If you look at a baby, a third of their face is eye, which is terrifying. Unless it's a baby, in which case it's adorable. So we actually are supposed to really favor that as a look. If you look at child actors, many of them have really outsized eyes. It's something that we find adorable. Um, but if we keep on going, we're going to run out of jaw, be mostly eye, and apparently adorable in babies, but terrifying when it's in a spaceship. <laughs> so yeah, not sure what's, what's up with that. So maybe I just read the long emergency with a little bit too much interest, but I find the idea of um, civilizations collapsing quite interesting. And sort of looking at the examples that I've seen throughout history, it seems to happen with much more regularity than modern people imagine it does. And I was wondering, through your long view of the historical perspective, do you think that our current civilization or collection of civilizations is due to last forever or are we halfway well, through an epoch or <laughs> this this is every pub conversation i've had since recent elections um i i, I you can tell from my accent i am american um and i, and I have a passport here too so it's it's a, a conversation that's certainly topical and and one of the interesting things is which keeps me from actively pursuing sort of life under a bus um is collapse doesn't kill everyone. What we think of collapse, you can almost kind of <coughs> see as I mean, it's this kind of old-fashioned um, Marxist idea of a revolution, where the gears of society and economics and stuff are sort of mushed in one way, and eventually a gear strips, that's a revolution, and something happens to change. But it doesn't kill everyone, it doesn't destroy everything. Uh, we think of, for instance, the fall of Rome as a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah, if you were a Roman elite. Turns out for like the Visigoths, it was a great day. Um, you know, this is not necessarily the end of everything. And a, a lot of things that we used to think about the Dark Ages, you know, that um, we'd lost all of the great knowledge of classical world. No, it just wasn't easily available. It was still hanging out somewhere else. A lot of um, the sort of lost knowledge of classics and things, they were, you know, in North Africa, in Iran, places like this. So. When we look at collapse, you can say there are some really terrifying possibilities, especially given that someone has a briefcase that can end the world. I feel like that is not a happy thought. But we haven't actually managed to massively sink ourselves. We have certainly managed to upend political orders. And you do have situations where, you know, um, where, where I dig in Turkey, uh, it is pretty much agrarian nowhere land. It is almost 100% goat population. But it used to be a major trading point. It used to be a massively important node of sort of transit. So things do change. And they don't always necessarily change for the better for those of us who are at the top now. So it's how, how you feel you can adapt to that. I think um, strategies for adapting to that are really what we have to be thinking about. Is um, not necessarily how do I live in the coming dystopia, you know, will I need radiation protection? But um, you know, uh, what comes next? What other organizations follow after this, this gear slips? Because it will eventually slip. Thanks.
Well, thank you very much, Brenna. That was fascinating. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for